welcome to our January 2023 Brown Bag History Lecture Series. We are so glad to see all the people here that made it through 2022. <laughs> um, my name is Gayla Kesey and I am Education Manager here at the Augusta Museum of History and we are so glad to have you join us for this wonderful event. Um, every year, Leanne Caldwell, Dr. Leanne Caldwell, provides an overview of what to expect for the rest of the year and so that's what we will get today and before we get started I want to sort of give you a clue of some of the things that are happening at the museum so you can put them on your calendar and make sure you join us for these other events I was telling uh, the people in the audience prior to uh, starting the live performance here that we have a brand new exhibit and they get to get a sneak peek today before it opens on Thursday. We will be highlighting the seasons in Augusta from our textile collection. So we start with winter and we have two of our interns back here that you can actually ask questions from about that if you really want to. And so they will be, um, that will be um, available on the second floor and the other thing that we have is February starts Black History Month and we have a number of events. In fact, our next brown bag is with Dr. Bobby Donaldson from the University of South Carolina and he's going to be talking about the completion of the uh, Springfield Village Park and what that was uh, all about that. So we invite you to Tune in on Facebook or register and come and join us in person. That will be on February 8th. Before that, on February 5th, however, we are having our family fun day. And one of the things that I put in this is that although this event celebrates black culture, we invite every ethnicity, every race, every heritage, every background, every age level to come and join us. We will have stories. Um, we will have Joyce Law is our going to do our storyteller. We also will have live music with Created to Play, which is a drum line from the Augusta area that is actually performed in the Atlanta Black History Month Parade. They've been in Indianapolis, so they're really cool. And we will also have crafts and a special Augusta African American bingo game. See how many people you know. We will also highlight that will be the first of our film screenings of a, each Sunday in February. We will be screening, and they went down both to the river, which is about the Springfield Village here in Augusta. It's a short documentary and it just released in 2023 and we are excited that we get to premiere it here. So we invite you to come and join us. It will be um, on February 5th, it will be up here and then the other Sundays we will have it in the Garden City room so that you can be down there. Um, we will also have, uh, we will end February with a special presentation by Creative Impressions called, um, I lost it, Genius in Chains. And Genius in Chains um, is a soulful celebration um, that chronicles the rich legacy of African American music that begins with its conception in Africa and other various countries and then moves into the modern influences and covers a multitude of genres. And it's something that you don't want to miss. And that will be at three o'clock on the last Sunday. So we invite you to join us here. We also have our ongoing series, The Voices of the Past, which are on Saturdays at 12.30, 1.30 and 2.30. And so the first one is The Other Tubmans, and that's the story of the connection between William Tubman of Liberia and the Tubman, Emily Tubman from Augusta. So you'll get to do that. Um, the second one, uh, the second Saturday is the Petersburg Boat Captain and tells you about 
coming down the river and what was that like uh, carrying the cotton down to the mills and, the, and to the canals. And then the third uh, Saturday is our Augusta civil rights activist and tells the story of growing up during Jim Crow in Augusta and then preparing for the sit-ins at Green's department store. So we invite you to come and join us for those. Those are all free with museum admission. So with that, oh, tomorrow night. Oh, I was going to say with that, <laughs> we, we were going to, the next thing that is immediate that if you saw when you came in that we are setting up for is the Jimmy Dias Symposium. We honor local um, people who have been involved in, um, in, in just, how do you put it? <laughs> in different kinds of community types of yeah. events. Uh, Pat Knox Hudson is one of our recipients. Ed Gillespie, I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. him. He ran the university hospital for years. Brandon Wilde, he created, I mean, it's, and then we have a Medal of Honor recipient. Yeah, this is and so that, we invite you, that starts at five, and I've been told it ends at six, military time. <laughs> uh, that we, we are right on task there, so we invite you to join us um, and come and be a part of that, and we hope that you will be a part of the museum and what we do here. With, um, now, I want to introduce Dr. Leanne Caldwell. I know she has recently retired. Oh, <laughs> no? No. No. Nah. Exactly. I'll explain it. Ah, she's going to explain it. All right, but she's with the Center for Augusta, uh, for Georgia Studies, and she is a professor at Augusta University. And she is also the co author of Augusta Then and Now, the book, along with Nancy Glazer our executive director and Jim Garvey, and some other notable books about Augusta history and Georgia history. And so we are excited to have her join us today and provide an overview. Thank you. So this retirement thing is complicated, isn't it? I am. I am a professor emeritus, so I am not teaching now but I still run the Center for the Study of Georgia History and I'm still the university historian, so it's sort of a, a purgatory instead <laughs> of a, a real total retirement. Now, I don't normally do this, but I did wear my red and black <laughs> because I got my doctorate at Georgia and you know, two years in a row, you have to honor that. So, so I'm here in my, uh, bulldog attire today. Um, so this was one of the hardest ones I've put together. And you know, I've been doing this for years because Nancy Glazer gets me into all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Nancy comes up with a theme every year and then we put our heads together and think about topics within that theme. And, um, and people who could address those topics. And of course, since we don't have, you know, a bunch of, of scholars, historians in the community, we like to get subjects that we can have people who actually work in an area or uh, have been involved with something for a long time uh, to talk as well. So doing it, in, certainly in the 20th century, is the best thing to do. But um, this year, Nancy said, I want to do turning points of the 21st century. Now, I will tell you as a longtime college professor that when I in my survey classes, my 2112 class, got up to the president before whoever was president now, I said, this is the um, political science sociology part of the course because it's not history yet. And what I meant by that was not that there weren't things that had happened that were historical and would certainly be history, but that for historians, the way we look at history, you can't do in the last 20 years um, because of several reasons. And I'll, I'll kind of tell you uh, some of those reasons. First of all, historians, we're looking not just for Fact, 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 fact. We're looking for patterns. What are the patterns? What are the trends? How do things evolve? 
What direction do they go in? And of course, um, we don't have any idea in 20 years what the patterns are yet. We can see maybe a trend, but does that turn into a, a, a pattern? Well, we don't know yet. Secondly, there's a lack of sources uh, early on. I mean, look at it. There's very little access even to the papers of George W. Bush, much less Obama, and certainly not Trump. There's no, not even a library started yet. So there's no way to get into the records and see what was going on beyond what we found, heard in the news, uh, which may or, may or may not always be accurate. Uh, and so we like to be able to get into records. Um, in the last, um, in the 21st century, the only in-depth records I've used are the thousands of pages of minutes of the Augusta Canal Authority. And that's because I'm writing, I have written, uh, a meeting actually with Dayton today, an update of the Augusta Canal history that will come out um, in a new book uh, a little bit later on this year. So I know what they were doing, but I don't know in depth what a lot of other people were doing in the last 20, 25 years or so. Uh, and so until we can get into more in-depth records, uh, it's hard to know everything that was going on. Sometimes it's people's records like manuscripts, letters, diaries, all those things that we get to read, which is uh, of course a lot of fun. Um, and perhaps most importantly, we don't yet know the sustainability of particular changes. We don't yet know what the long-term effects are going to be. I can now tell you the long-term effects of World War II. We can talk about what some of the effects of even the Vietnam War are, but the, the closer we get to the present, we're still looking for how it's gonna play out uh, in the long term. Uh, some effects are generational, one generation to the next, um, or even you know, multi-generational. So sometimes what looks like a turning point may turn out not to be a turning point. Something happened, it looked like it was gonna make a big change, and then we go back to stasis. We return to whatever the form of status quo was. Um, so, let, let, let me give you an example. World War II was a turning point for the nation. It was a turning point for Georgia. It was a turning point for Augusta. Uh, for one thing, it brought military to this state, and it's been here ever since. And it's in some very significant and important ways that actually changed the direction um, that the community was going. Um, there were even personal turning points as a result. For example, the GI Bill um, made it possible for people who would not have been able to buy housing to buy houses, made it possible for young men who would not have been able to go to college to go to college. So it changed people's lives and was certainly a turning point for them. But that also means that it changed the community. Look at when a lot of our earliest sort of housing developments were built after World War II, when there's this demand. So we see developments in South Augusta, like Forest Acres, we see developments like National Hills, um, as there's an effort to, um, for these people who, who can now use the GI Bill uh, to get housing. World War II led to the Cold War, which led to SRS. That was a turning point. Um, and we've got a couple of scientists in here who, uh, who know that. Um, and so we can definitely say this is a turning point in Augusta and Georgia and local history. Let's come more recently, the pandemic. Was the pandemic a turning point? A lot of people think maybe the pandemic was a turning point. There were predictions after um, a couple of years that uh, people aren't going to work the same way anymore. Everybody's going to be work more, a lot more people going to be working from home. And, well, maybe not. Because if you look at more recent trends, they're demanding that people come back to work. Uh, and so even though it cut down on pollution, 
it cut down on commutes, it cut down on all kinds of things. It, it provided better childcare in some cases. Um, but we don't know if that is really going to be the turning point that it looked like it was. So, as I pondered this, what am I going to talk about? Um, as a historian um, in the early 20th century, and I decided to talk about changes that have happened that are underway and, um, and be able to say to you, I don't know yet if they're turning points. So we're going to look at um, the upcoming talks uh, very briefly. I'm just going to kind of touch on what people are going to be talking about. Um, but I want to look at a couple of things that I really do think are going to prove to be turning points. And then when we look at some of the cultural issues, we're looking for tipping points. And there's a little bit of difference. I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, so let me go back just a minute. You know, historians, we all have to set up the background. Um, in 1982, Augusta Tomorrow was founded, and they began to work on a plan of revitalization for Augusta after two malls had devastated the downtown, although the trend of things moving away from downtown had already begun. Um, in 1988, partially uh, as a result of some of this planning, Riverwalk opened. And what Riverwalk showed was that you could get people back into this inner city, into the core of the community. And that led to a kind of burst of things going on uh, in the 1990s. And I just want to run through some of them. Port Royal was built on the river and of course there was a, a wonderful science center uh, there for a number of years that everybody thought was a turning point but it's not there anymore so you never know what's going to last and what's not. Uh, the Radisson now Marriott Hotel was built uh, and that allowed for larger conventions than we had been able to have before uh, and of course we've attracted a lot of people in. The Lucy Craft Laney Museum was built um, in Lucy Craft Laney's home after it was um, uh, restored. And that was, that's been a pretty much turning point for that neighborhood. They provide not just history, but all kinds of cultural opportunities, art, computer classes for kids, senior days, uh, senior lunches, all kinds of things come out of that museum. The Morris Museum of Art largest collection of Southern art in the world. Um, and that has been a big draw. The American, uh, the American, the Augusta Museum of History moved from its smaller digs over on Telfair Street into this wonderful structure, big enough for a train uh, inside. Um, and that has been a real draw as well. We have had the restoration of the Woodrow Wilson House next door to the Joseph Lamar House, the only house of a president and Supreme Court justice in the country, two houses next door to each other. The restoration of the Imperial Theater had been done in the 90s. Um, and then, of course, um, in a minute, I'll talk about what happens in the 2000s. The Jesse Norman Amphitheater was built in the 90s. Uh, the Fennessey, what's now Fennessey Water Resources, uh, started in the 90s. The Inter Enterprise Mill restoration renovation was done in 19, finished in 1998, and all of a sudden people are moving downtown again. The Children's Medical Center, now the CHOG, the Children's Hospital of Georgia. Um, the designation of the Augusta Canal as a national heritage area and across the river, the building of the Living History Park, and in 1995, the Augusta Greenway, which actually began to draw people into North Augusta. Major events included things like uh, Arts in the Heart, which had started in the 80s, the rowing regatta had started in the 80s, the drag boat racing started in the 80s, but that sets the stage for what's gonna happen in the 2000s. So let's start with the thing that I think is a turning point, the economy. Um, and of course, you know, I'm pulling out threads, but the economy affects these other things. 
and they affect the economy. So it's really a tapestry uh, that we're building. As the 20th century closed, the decline of the textile industry was already underway. Um, they had, of course, lost uh, jobs to robotics first. The tech came in first. What had had several hundred people working in a mill uh, had 125 working, and most of those were in quality assurance, and they were, you know, taking care of the robots um, that were doing uh, what human beings used to do uh, with bobbins and looms and all of that kind of thing. Um, so the, the last one of the mills is going to phase out in the 2000s, but that handwriting was on the wall. Another turn, however, that was occurring is the industries that had been recruited in after World War II by the Committee of 100 of the Chamber of Commerce, um, groups like Procter & Gamble, International Paper, which when I was growing up was Continental Can Corporation, those kinds of big industries that made up what was called Miracle Mile out in South Augusta, put thousands of people um, to work, they were moving too, um, which was a, a big issue. I remember doing an interview with uh, the news about some of these last closings and what was going to happen. And of course, um, and not everything left. I mean, we have two homegrown industries, two um, manufacturers that are still here and thriving, and that's our own folks, EasyGo and Club Car. And they will probably stay here. So we, which says something about having your own homegrown manufacturing and what will happen. Um, importantly, um, Augusta had what is soon to be known as Fort Eisenhower, which, by the way, I don't know how you feel about it, but I am so relieved that we are going to have Fort Eisenhower because as a historian, I hated it when people said, where did the name come from? And now I can say it comes from a president of the United States. Um, and so um, soon to be Fort Gordon survived the 90s. All of that fort closure um, and base closure that was going on, Fort Gordon survived. And that led to a turning point for us, and that is the introduction of cyber. Because that's the economy, that's going to be the economic rock that replaces um, some of these things that we have lost. The choice of Augusta for the Army Cyber Center in 2016 and the Cyber School of Excellence not only is bringing these institutions here and is changing the face of, of Fort um, Still Gordon, but soon to be Eisenhower, um, but it's bringing thousands of people in. I don't know if any of you live in Columbia County, but it's a traffic nightmare right now. Um, there, I didn't even recognize. I didn't. I didn't know where I was. I tried to. Uh, I was trying to get to Harlem. And when I got to Grovetown, it was confusing. There was so much traffic. Um, and I talked to people out there. They have to leave home early to get to work on time. But once we get past the growing pains, because this happened fairly quickly, you know, um, and if you don't have time to plan for something, uh, then you end up with all these unintended uh, effects. Um, so it's led to a demand for housing, which has boosted that industry. Um, it's led to a demand for educational facilities. They're building almost a school a year, I think I heard, out in Columbia County now. Um, and of course, it led to a bunch of other cyber stuff, um, including um, the Deal Center for Cyber Innovation and uh, Training. Uh, and that was finished in 2018. I wanted to get my my theme right here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how Augusta University fits into this when I talk about education and some of the real turning points in education here. So um, these 
these uh, economic changes fit in well which, with stuff that was already ongoing, um, especially the revitalization of, uh, of the community. Um, the loft movement had begun when Clay Boardman finished Enterprise Mill in 1998. Um, there had been a few people um, in these lofts before, but not many. Um, and then everybody got interested in getting a cool loft apartment downtown, especially certain generations of people. Now we're beginning to see retired people come downtown too, but the millennial generation was probably first, and now what we're calling Gen Z um, is adult and beginning to make these kinds of decisions. And they like living downtown. I mean, they tell me it's great. You just walk out of your apartment and you, you go to whatever restaurant you want to go to. And that, of course, led to a boom in restaurant and entertainment facilities and that kind of thing. So uh, it's really helped. Now, is this new? No. Merchants did this 100 years ago. So there was a thriving downtown community 100 years ago. But in that turning point when everything moved out of downtown, now we're beginning to see what is old become new again. And fortunately, the infrastructure is already there. And it's so much more environmentally friendly to renovate a loft apartment than it is to build something brand new. Um, there were efforts for other neighborhoods that were spawned out of all of this too. Look what's going on in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And the interest of the Augusta National and, and the Community and Foundation, these other groups getting interested in that has been important. Um, the Crocs Center, and then all the revitalization around the Crocs Center. And then Clay Boardman founding Turn Back the Block, which began to not build new, but to use, well, some of it's building new now, but some of it was just using the infrastructure that was already there. There are efforts going on in the Lane Walker neighborhood. The Lane Walker neighborhood, so here's one of those turning points. Civil rights era happens, and it's a major turning point. We begin to dismantle Jim Crow. We didn't get it all the way done, but we began to dismantle Jim Crow. One of the unintended consequences was that the Laney Walker neighborhood, which had been a thriving community, began to decline as middle class people and younger people moved out, uh, leaving it with less, less um, leadership, for one thing. Um, and, um, people really not knowing what to do to bring it back. Well, now they're making efforts to bring that back. Um, and of course, this wonderful new hub center that's where Kroger used to be is trying to work with both of those neighborhoods, Lane Walker and Harrisburg. And I mean, the things that are there, the clinic, the literacy center, the, all the sports opportunities, uh, it's really quite incredible. Will it work? So far, we'll see long term. Um, uh, if, it, if it turns out to be a major, major turning point. The city of Augusta wasn't the only one to benefit. Look what's going on across the river. Um, the city of North Augusta, which is now over 100 years old, they, they emerged in the 1890s, um, is really coming into its own. Um, that, that Greenway started attracting walkers and cyclists and others to come over there, got people more familiar with it. They began other projects like Turner Simpkins and his group that did that planned Hammonds Ferry Community, um, which has begun to attract boomers. I can't tell you how many people I know who have moved over there, even out of Somerville, which is a little bit surprising. And I'll tell you, the, when boomers, as young people went to North Augusta, it was because you could buy beer when you were 18. And so people would head over the river for that reason. Uh, but now um, people are attracted to these wonderful um, uh, neighborhoods that North Augusta is building. All right, preservation has been an important part of this. Um, joining the iconic Rosemary Lookaway Halls, which you all know, you drive over the bridge and, and there um, in the center of the street is Look Away and over on the other side, Rosemary, I think I got those right. Um, but now, um, I don't know if you've read about James O'Neill, 
um, redoing the Charles Hammond House, which is probably the oldest house in all of this area. It's a Revolutionary War. Um, and we used to think that the Ezekiel Harris house was the Mackey house, which would have been, but it's not. So, um, so James may have the oldest house around. So, um, and of course, Project Jackson has brought, and I'm going to talk about sports a little bit later, but they also brought the wonderful hotel over there, which is the first really kind of um, resort, nice hotel like that since the Hampton Terrace burned down in 1916. Um, one of the important drivers of the economy has been for a long time in Augusta, Georgia, is medicine. A medical center with several major hospitals for much of the 20th century, well, certainly the post-World War II era. In the 1990s, University Hospital and what, what we knew growing up as St. Joseph Hospital uh, collaborated to open Brandon Wild. And by the way, welcome to all my Brandon Wild people who are watching online to the online version of this. Um, uh, then the Sisters of Carondelet pulled out of St. Joseph, which became Trinity Hospital, bought out by University. And so University had that, and University called it University Hospital Somerville. Um, so we've had this, and of course, Doctors is out there, Eisenhower is there, and I'm going to talk about AU uh, separately in just a minute. Um, then last year, University merged with Piedmont and uh, announced last week, we got the email at school, I think it was last week, that AU Health is. Uh, Going to, going to be merged with Wellstar. So, getting corporate, but there are also some benefits that come from that. I talked to a good friend of mine who uh, was, oh, I, well, not talked, but uh, we emailed uh, Bill Brown, who was the deputy commander out at Fort Ward. He thinks the Wellstar thing is going to be a, a good thing for AU Help, which kind of settled me down a little bit because I wasn't exactly sure uh, what that was going to mean. Um, and University of Piedmont, Augusta, by the way, that change helped solve a mystery for everybody who moves here from somewhere else. They didn't understand why that hospital would call, was called University when it was not associated with the university. And of course, that <laughs> is because it was until Medical College got its own hospital. Um, but Piedmont has now offered the old St. Joseph Trinity facilities to Augusta Tech. And it's going to become the health facility, health sciences facility for them, which may be a big, big, um, important turning point for Augusta Tech. Uh, and of course, we need more nurses and nursing assistants, assistants and, and those kind of things. So that's going to be really important. Um, one of the, the biggest changes, and this fits somewhat into medicine and somewhat into education, was the announcement in 2012 that the following year, Georgia Health Sciences University slash MCG was going to merge with Augusta State University. The merger took place January 2013, so we're 10 years anniversary right now. Um, it was painful in the beginning because the institutions had very, very different cultures. Their missions had been different. Their cultures were different. I think it was a little harder for those of us up on the uh, what's now the Somerville campus of AU um, because we were used to a kind of communication and interaction that doesn't happen anymore. I have no idea what's going on in the College of Math and Science now. Um, and I used to know what was going on in every college and department there. But we're big now, and it's, it's just a different culture. But it has brought some real um, advantages um, that um, are getting worked out in the long work one. And I think, um, I think people are now very happy with the thing, way things are going. We have many new programs that we would not have had. 
uh, in a variety of disciplines. Everybody thinks everything new is going on with the medical college, but um, we started in our uh, art department, which is now the Department of Art and Design. Uh, we have started programs that include a program in animation that is so popular that they are opening it for I forgot how many more hundreds slots next year um, and making a major expansion to that program. We now have an opera institute and the opera institute works with the ENTs at MCG uh, to make sure everybody understands how to take care of their very valuable instruments. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration that's going on. But, and this is what is really interesting, we also now have a School of Computer and Cyber Sciences. That would not have happened without this turning point change in the economy. It includes degrees in cyber engineering, cyber operations, information technology, which we already had. We now have a master in science in information security. Um, and we have a PhD in computer and cyber science. We also have certificates in cyber defense and in healthcare security. This is all in just two or three years that all of this has happened. A major pivot, and guess what? Those programs are filling up. They're very, very competitive. And I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to take Gretchen Kaufman's talk because she's going to come and talk about the impact of the merger um, in one of the later programs. Um, another important development, as I said, was the expansion of, uh, of Augusta Tech and the founding of a tech magnet school I was listening to NPR this morning of the Georgia, um, Bill Nugget program about Georgia, uh, and they were talking about um, trying to get our workforce ready for the things that are coming, and these tech programs are a major, major uh, part of that, because if people want to come here, we want to be able to say, come, we, we've got the people uh, to fill your jobs. Um, these changes in health and education, remember, are connected to the economy and they impact the economy itself. So it, it feeds on each other. All right, looking at other changes, we note uh, that Augusta has rich resources, rich natural resources from the river to uh, some of the natural uh, beauty of the surrounding areas, some of the uh, agricultural resources around here, rich in natural resources, but also in historical. I'll tell you a story, um, Robert Osmond, who was president of Historic Augusta, was involved in trying to, they were trying to hire somebody to do the next master plan with, uh, I believe it was Augusta Tamar, and uh, they got six companies from all over, six firms from all over the country. Every one of them, without being you know, prompted, when they did their evaluation of Augusta said, you are one of the luckiest cities we've ever seen. Most people would just love to have the historical resources and the natural resources and the cultural resources that you already have. I think we don't appreciate ourselves enough uh, sometimes. Um, and so uh, as I looked through these years and looked at the events of these years, I was struck by how many things were related to culture, to quality of life, to preservation of the past, adapting to the new, um, and these are all related to the changes we've already talked about. So I'm just going to, these are other talks that are coming up, and I just want to kind of quickly go through some of this. In 1996, the Augusta Canal National Heritage Authority, uh, area was approved, and that is what led to the Canal Authority being able to do everything it's done. Most of that has been done in the last 20 years. To 22 years. They really began a lot of this in the early uh, 2000s. Um, and, and I know this because I've read thousands of pages of their minutes. Um, trails, an interpretive center, Petersburg boat, school programs, adult programs, events, 
hosting convention groups, ho hosting foreign groups, being involved with the national heritage areas throughout the country. Dayton Shirouse was president of the National Heritage Alliance at least four times. Um, so we have a reputation now in that field. Um, another outdoor park that was a multi-year project you're going to hear about next month from one of the most exciting speakers you can hear, and that's Bobby Donaldson from University of South Carolina, who grew up in Augusta as a graduate of Davidson Fine Arts School um, and got his doctorate at Emory University. Um, that And that is the 2.5 acre venue Springfield Village Park. Um, it kind of goes back to Historic Augusta stepping in in the, in the 1970, late 70s because they were going to tear down their 1801 building mm -hmm. and saying, no, you have the oldest church building. You have history. You need to save it. And your history is important. Uh, and then by the 2000s, late 90s, 2000s, there was this movement to make a park and some way to tell that history. Um, in 2002, that began with two monumental, well, not both of them in 2002, but two monumental sculptures. And, you know, people have different feelings about those, but the, but the um, sculptor uh, is one of the most well-known mm. internationally sculpt, black sculptors uh, in the world, uh, Richard Hunt. And that one at the top, and if you know what it's about, it makes it makes perfect sense. The one at the top is called uh, the Tower of Aspiration. And the one at the bottom, the, the circular one, uh, is called, and they went down into the water. Um, and it, it tells the story. Well, that was all that was there. The, you know, the structure of the park was there. But in 2019, the history went in with wonderful plaques that have both text, drawings, and photographs that start at the bottom with early history and go throughout the history of the African American community. Those plaques were done by your next speaker, Bobby Donaldson. Uh, he did the research and found the resources and, and that kind of thing. It's uh, an almost 300 year history. Historic preservation, um, uh, the boyhood home of Woodrow Wilson uh, opened in 2002. The speaker that opened it, or the speaker for the first Wilson lecture was Dr. Arthur Link, the preeminent scholar of uh, Woodrow Wilson. Um, and we've been doing those every year since. Ed did them um, until as long as he was alive and then I took over them and so We'd love to have you come to some of those as well. The house is interpreted for his childhood, but we now have an exhibit in the Lamar house next door um, of his, uh, his adulthood and his presidency. Another significant brand new uh, addition to the museum community is the Augusta Jewish Museum. And this is another exciting story of preservation because they were gonna tear it down to build parking lot, or to build more parking spaces. Um, and so there was a lot of work with the Jewish community and Historic Augusta and others to make sure that that didn't happen. And now the Court of Ordinary will open its exhibit this spring. In fact, I think there's a date coming up for that. Uh, and they're working on the old synagogue itself, which will be an event center. Um, we're blessed with historic theaters. The Imperial was already there, but we're getting close to the theater district these days. Um, because in the 2000s, the Imperial, I mean, the uh, Miller has been saved. And we're going to hear that story in a later uh, uh, talk. Um, the Imperial has also had a lot going on. I don't know if you realize, but Imperial got some SPLOS money, and they fixed, they fixed some major, major structural issues with drainage and flooding and roofing and, and that sort of thing. Um, but of course, the story of the saving of the Miller, I did a talk um, on Frank Miller a, a while back, fascinating man um, who basically lived and raised his children with his in-laws while he saved up to build his own theater, um, which opened in 1940 and was that art moderne. It was just, you know, cutting edge. He even had air conditioning. 
um, when it opened to reform with the air conditioning. Um, and so Peter Knox bought that theater um, in 2005. He stabilized it. He, he stabilized the roof, got a new roof on it, and stabilized it and offered it to the Augusta Symphony. And led by Levi Hill, they did an amazing, amazing job of raising the capital to do such a beautiful and authentic uh, restoration. It opened in 2018. Of course, now it's Symphony Hall, but it's also the, the Miller has a separate board that hosts other events. The one I've seen advertised recently is the the Chinese um, dancer uh, and acrobat group. It looks pretty fascinating. Um, joining these edifices and monuments and parks is now a major public art program. And Pax Babrow is going to be here from the Augusta Arts Council to talk about that program. It's pretty exciting. I actually read about it in the minutes of the Augusta Canal, who now have three uh, of the sculptures because the canal was one of the trails for sculpture. And they're different. Uh, each from the other and very interesting. Uh, in 2012, the City Commission designated the Arts Council as the Public Arts Agency and asked them to come up with a policy for public art. That got approved in 2016 um, and they developed a 10-year Augusta Master Plan for Art. Um, one of the things they did was a survey on how much public art we had. Um, at the time of that survey, um, which they finished in 2017, Augusta had 13 installations. Asheville had 30, and Greenville, which everybody holds up as the way everybody wants to be now, had 53. So that says something about how important public art is to, um, to citizens today. Um, so there are gonna be all kinds of installations that come from that. And finally, while Augusta has been known for golf for a long time, not just since the National, but people were coming here every winter for two to three months to play golf at the Von Air Lynx um, and the Augusta Country Club. Um, so we had a golf uh, ethos here that was important. Uh, and the fact that those people will come in here to play is one of the reasons the Nationals there. For example, if you've ever driven down Millage and you see Bourne Place, B-O-U-R-N-E, uh, there's an Alfred Bourne Award that the PGA gives. Alfred Bourne um, lived in Morningside, that big white house by uh, Bourne Place, that white mansion. They called it the Lodge. The Bournes <laughs> called it the Lodge. Um, but Alfred Bourne was donated in the Depression $25,000 to help get the National going. So those connections um, made a real difference. But um, we're getting known for other things sports-wise uh, besides golf. The Augusta Green Jackets have been around for a while, but with their new stadium over in North Augusta, kind of drawing our two cities together, um, they've spurred even more growth over there. Um, and in addition to that, um, people, Randy Duto, who's going to come talk about sports in there, Randy's a cyclist himself. Uh, he worked with the Olympic cycling um, in uh, 1996, so his interest goes back a long way. Um, but he's brought things like the Tour of Georgia through Augusta and other important uh, cycling events, but now he brings all kinds of things to Augusta, uh, like Peach Jam and, um, and all of that. Uh, Nadia Butler, when she was here in Augusta, brought the Iron Man, half Iron Man here, which is now one of the largest in the world. Um, and that adds to things that we already had going on, and Randy's going to talk about some of that. So, if any one of these cultural trends, is any one of these cultural trends a turning point? I mean, if you look at all that culture put together, it may be, uh, certainly, we may be the, at the tipping point. Maybe not, um, you know, we'll see how long some of it lasts. We used to have the drag boat races down on the river, and we don't have them. They were good for 30 years, but we don't have them anymore. Um, so 
But right now, all of this stuff added together is turning the community in the direction of a higher quality of life with more options and more opportunities. So, what will last? What will have a long-term effect? I have no idea. Which is why I don't like giving talks like this. Because I like to, I like to be able to say, I think that this is, is um, what happened and why it happened. Um, for example, um, you know, there are significant global changes that affect what ha happens to us. And we don't know what those global changes. Um, all these things like textiles that moved overseas for cheaper labor, now that we have supply chain issues and we have the environmental cost of transportation, will some of that start moving back to America? There's talk about that. We'll have to see. Um, so what about things like our retail structure? How many of you buy your stuff online? A lot of people. And so what's happening? Sears is gone. Bed that thing out and maybe gone before long. I did read that our Macy's is not going to be one of them that, that closes right now. But what is the long-term trend? Because all of those are jobs gone, as well as lack of uh, options for people like me who want to try on their clothes um, <laughs> when they buy them. Uh, and so, you know, what what is going to happen uh, to retail? Is it going to be online? If so, we've got Amazon here now. So is that going to replace? Are people going to go to those jobs instead of working in the mall and working in the stores? Uh, we'll have to see. So in the future, I think, Nancy and I might not be around, but I think you should get some future historian to come back in 20 years or so and elucidate which of these trends was a true turning point, which was a true long-term change. Scientists warn that we are reaching an environmental tipping point if we haven't already reached it. And in the end, that may be the biggest turning point of all. So we'll see. Thank you so much. I appreciate most of you come every time, including those of you who are now watching online. And you don't know how much I appreciate the support you've given me over these years. I don't know how many more years I'm going to be able to do this, but I appreciate the fact that you have supported me. So thank you. Uh, questions? We'll see you next month. Oh, Did she have a question? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go, go. Yes. My question is, you're talking about turning points. And as you're talking about them, I'm seeing not a turning point, but a growth of something that was a turning point 100 or something years ago. It, and at that point, it may not, it may shrink back, but it's, to me it's not, other than the cyber school, I will say that's a- Yeah, that's, that's why I said, that's one. why I said, I think the cyber is a real turning that point. Is a turning and I actually think the merger of the universities <laughs> is probably a turning point for education here. Uh, because it's very different than it was before and the opportunities are very different and the programs are very different. We're going to start putting out people that have different knowledge and different skills. So I think that may prove to be a true turning point. Not that we haven't had education in the fact in the past, but the kind of education, the way it's delivered, those kinds of things well, I, I think are changing. One thing. I was in Australia and I was in Perth at the time. I met a man whose son was here in Augusta going to medical college. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's part of it too. You start attracting people from a, a lot broader field uh, when you. We're now a, a research university moving up the ladder of research university. We've got got the NIH grants, which is one of the big measures of you know what kind of research university you are. No, I agree with you. That was part of my point that. Um, saying what's a turning point in 20 years is very hard to do. But I'm saying your turning points are growing from what was already... Some of them are. Not, yeah, like cyber is but, but that's true of everything, yeah. in a way. Exactly. I mean, every now and then there's a contingency thrown in like a hurricane hits. 
or something. That can be a, an instantaneous turning point. World War II was the turning point, but there were things that were leading up to that for a long time, and trends that it simply accelerated. So um, it's, it's, it's semantics, really, in a way. Um, but yeah, and Just curious, um, you mentioned the military started this in, after World War II. Actually, Camp Hancock brought people here to It did. Temporarily. Not, not as much. Well, and temporarily. Yeah. It closed in 1921, I believe, yeah. if I remember right. And uh, I mean, we've had military since Fort Augusta. Um, and we had Camp McKenzie in the Spanish American War. We've had the arsenal from the 1819 to 1955. So we have had military connections, but it's the the influx of military that stayed, that stayed, um, and uh, that happened all over the South because they found out in World War II that training soldiers year-round in the South was a really beneficial thing. Uh, and so they kept a lot of um, the bases until the 90s when they went through the, the base closure. Which yeah. you also get a lot of people who have been here, they know the weather, which except for in the summer is great. <laughs> But then they come back and retire here. Absolutely. They have the exchange, they have their military staff. Absolutely. And the fact that Eisenhower is here is a big draw for retirees. Um, and we get, you know, people at all ranks, including generals, uh, who come back and retire here. So, and that's been important for the community. Um, I worry about downtown Augusta. There's so many um, empty storefronts. And there's such a movement by uh, communities like Columbia County. And now I read in the newspaper that Somerville is considering organizing. A small group of people in Somerville are talking saying, about that. Yeah. I do not think that will happen. It would be a huge mistake. Well, I, I hope don't think that would happen because. But, you know, um, I mean, some of the things that we have, like the Riverwalk is like this jewel of downtown, but it's not maintained well. Right, and and I think that's something the mayor's going to work on. Uh -huh. um, as far as empty, there are empty stores because of the changes in retail. But I mean, you know, they can be converted into other things, and it just seems like there's no movement. You know, like Rubens is kind of still there, but it's not really... Um, utilized as a as a shopping area. Well, well, if you come down here, especially at night, you can't even get. Oh no, I know the restaurants are doing well. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you when you walk place. the downtown area, the yeah. feeling you get is that there's just a lot of empty storefronts. Well, there are so many fewer than there used to be, mm -hmm. and I think the more people move down here, the more call well, there will be big, for more that, things. You know, that's big. I don't know what that is going on on Telfair. Yeah, you know, between Telfair. Yeah, yeah. That is huge. I don't know what that is. Is that it's going to be an apartment complex? It's a car uh -huh. apartment. Oh, it's an apartment complex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So more people are going to be moving. So, yeah, so that's good. Yeah, yeah and part of that is as NCG and the health uh -huh. sciences area expands, we got. I mean, those apartments that are called Canal Side uh -huh. that are right across from University. Right. Those are full. Yeah. Um, but I mean, downtown is so beautiful because yeah. they retained the buildings, but they're not being, you know, like really utilized so that everybody can really appreciate that. May I yeah. say something? The whole Tia thing is going to change. Tia's Floss is going to change the whole look of downtown. Okay. And that is coming up. The money is there. The planning is being taken place, has already taken place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the scheduling of how all that's going to be done. What I would do is go talk to Margaret Woodard over yes, at the yes, DBA about yeah. downtown development, and downtown. she will fill in the blanks for you yeah, because yes. there's a I, lot going I, on. I, I love downtown. downtown. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming. Very much. We'll see you next month.